Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Matthias Klaassen. He is Associate Professor in Literature and Media at Aarhus University in Denmark. He is the Director of the Recreational Fear Lab and Associate Editor of Evolutionary Studies in Imaginative Culture. He studies horror fiction and is the author of books like Why Horror Seduces and A Very Nervous Person Guide to Horror Movies. So, Dr. Klassen, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Same here. Thank you. So, I mean, let's start perhaps with uh, a definition, perhaps what would people in uh, psychology and science in general would call uh, operationalize what <laughs> we're studying here. So what is horror? What is horror? That should be an easy question, but it's really not. Um, but I guess you could say that, first of all, horror is an emotion. It's a feeling state, uh, but it's also a specific type of entertainment, a certain kind of story. Um, so a horror story is a story that's designed to evoke powerful negative emotions in the audience. Um, and I think probably everybody has some experience with horror stories, um, scary books, uh, frightening movies, even interactive horror stories of the sort that we find in in video games or haunted attractions. So one way of operationalizing horror is to define it as a kind of story that um, is designed to frighten the audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, how would you approach it from an evolutionary perspective? Because I guess that's your main frame here, right? Yeah, yeah, that's my thing. And that has been my thing for, for a long time. Um, Early on in my academic career, I, I discovered the, I guess you could say, the um, explanatory power of an evolutionary perspective. Um, I'd been curious about horror stories for a long time, uh, personally curious, fascinated. What was it about this specific type of story that, that attracted me, while at the same time I paid a high price? Uh, so I'd read scary stories and I couldn't sleep for a couple of days. <laughs> I'd watch scary movies as a teenager and I'd have to sleep with the lights on. And yet I still kept going back. So what was going on? And so I looked to uh, research to see if I could get deeper into the psychological machine room of uh, frightening fiction. And I was disappointed with what I found. But then I discovered evolutionary social science, uh, which is an approach to the study of human thinking and human behavior. And that gave me some answers that I thought were much more satisfying. Um, so from an evolutionary perspective, horror is about simulating threat. It is about allowing us to immerse ourselves in imaginary worlds that are full of danger, made up danger, but still uh, fictional danger that reliably makes us afraid, uh, yet fascinates us. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, are there uh, specific elements in horror stories that would grab people's attention because they are evolutionarily relevant? I mean, they are things that, evolutionarily speaking, we should pay attention to. I think so, yes. And I think that's the right question to ask. Because um, if you look at the contents of horror movies and horror books and so on, it seems hopelessly out of date. I mean, why would people flock to movies about serial killers and uh, huge monsters mm -hmm. when those kinds of conflicts between human characters and uh, forces of evil don't really match the kinds of challenges that we face in our day-to-day -day life? Uh, but still, the, 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 con the basic conflict of horror, which is a conflict between a human character who doesn't want to get killed and a human or non-human character who wants to kill the human character, the monster versus man basic premise is an evolutionarily relevant one. Uh, so in a sense, when we, when we watch a horror movie or read a horror book or play a horror video game, we are on a imaginative time travel back to an earlier stage in human evolution when 
our ancestors did have to confront dangerous forces in the world around them. So that basic scenario, the basic premise of um, survival, it's essentially about surviving uh, dangerous forces. That is evolutionarily relevant and has a certain salience because of that, uh, because it's such a basic basic problem, staying alive in a dangerous world. That's what horror is all about, and that was what existence in prehistoric times was all about. Mm -hmm. But is there anything special about horror that we do not find in other types of stories? Mm. I'm not sure there is. Um, in a sense, uh, maybe you could compare it to a pizza. Uh, some people like lots of hot pepper on their pizza, some don't. Uh, but you can get a pepperoni pizza with a little bit of hot pepper sprinkled on it. Uh, the, the analog here would be maybe a crime story that has some gruesome scenes and some horror elements and that maybe make the audience or the reader uh, feel a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of apprehension or dread. And then the horror story is a pizza that's just full of, you know, jalapenos and uh, hot peppers and, and things like that. So, so you can find the elements of horror in all genres. You can find horror comedies crime shows with horror elements, science fiction with uh, scary monsters, um, westerns with cannibals, you know. Um, no, even so adventure uh, movies, for example, and epics. I remember, for example, The Lord of the Rings, even though it's an adventure epic movie, there's orcs there, for example. Precisely. Uh, epic fantasy, um, that's a good that's a good example. So so you find the elements of horror and the monsters that we normally associate with horror all over the landscape of popular culture. Mm -hmm. So uh, are there specific cultural and soci social factors that play a role into how people appreciate horror? Um, that's also hard to answer in any very decisive and concise way. Um, there are certainly cultural differences uh, in the shape of horror stories and also maybe in the prevalence. Um, so if you take a figure like the ghosts, I mean, that's a very characteristically um, horror typical figure, the scary ghosts. Um, Western and Eastern ghosts are a little bit different. Um, Eastern ghosts have more agency, they have more materiality. So a ghost in a Japanese horror movie can interact with the material world. That's not normally the case for a ghost in a Western horror movie. And so that is a cultural difference that makes itself felt in the way uh, one specific horror antagonist is portrayed. Um, social differences it does seem to be the case that horror horror movies specifically appeal across the social spectrum. So it's a very diverse genre in a way. Uh, but then again, there are cultures in which horror uh, is very pervasive and cultures in which horror is less pervasive. But I don't think you can find a culture that doesn't have horror stories. I do think it's a universal genre. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. Do we know anything specific about why uh, people depict monsters, for example, the way they do? I mean, of course, some of them have elements of things that exist in nature. Some of them are sort of combinations of dangerous animals or uh, traits of different dangerous animals, for example. But, uh, I mean, uh, do they have to be credible enough to have sort of uh, terrifying or horror effect on people? Because, uh, I mean, is, do we know if there's a limit and perhaps from a certain point on it's too ridiculous for it to be scary or something right. like that? Yeah, now that's a really interesting empirical question. It hasn't, it hasn't been tested in any systematic way. Um, but I do think there is a limit. Um, so certain horror monsters or 
horror antagonists are relatively plausible. Like this shark in Jaws, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that looks and behaves more or less like a real shark. I mean, it is a little bit exaggerated, and most horror monsters are. Um, they are, in a sense, a sort of supernormal stimulus. So take uh, a real world threat and exaggerate it. Um, present your characters with a huge spider or an enormous sh uh, snake or a shark that has emotions of vengeance, for example, or is supernaturally strong. And Jaws, of course, as we know, when that movie came out in the 1970s, it really frightened people. Mm -hmm. um, so we can see a real a, a drop in beach tourism in North America just after the, <laughs> the release of Jaws. Uh, and then there are certain horror monsters that are uh, much less plausible, the supernatural ones, uh, the demons, the, the giant uh, monsters from space, which to some people are too ridiculous. Um, so there has to be a little bit of individual variation also. Uh, some people don't find the idea of supernatural forces of evil very plausible. Many people do. I mean, it's it's an element in religions all over the world. And so for people who, who are able to entertain the the concept of a supernatural agent of evil as, as, as something that might be real, then even horror movies about that ki that kind of monster is are um, are frightening. Mm -hmm. But I imagine you are right. I mean, I did watch a horror movie a few years ago about uh, zombie beavers, and that was beyond my own limit of of plausibility. Mm -hmm. An undead beaver. I mean, come on. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the supernatural, I guess that uh, in my questions or in my previous questions specifically, I focused on visual depictions of monsters of horror. But of course, there are things that do not necessarily need to be visual. I mean, sometimes it can just be sounds or sometimes people can just believe in... Uh, certain forces or phenomena that are not embodied, let's say, and that can still be terrifying. I mean, for example, I remember watching the movie more than 10 years ago, Paranormal Activity, and at least in the first one, it's not that you really see anything embodied there a ghost or a monster but it's still really really terrifying so yeah no that's a good point and uh, perhaps even more extreme example would be uh the blair witch project uh -huh. yeah um, a so-called uh, found footage horror movie from the late 1990s in which we never see the witch of the title all we see for 90 minutes is three kids looking frightened and we hear weird noises and there are cues that might signal uh, danger or imminent threat, but we don't see it. Um, so that's true. I mean, that's it's a very effective way of mobilizing the audience's own imagination and prompting us to entertain, you know, um, uh, imaginings of, of, of terrifying things. And usually what the human imagination can cook up is worse than what any special effects artists or CGI uh, programmer can can present us with. Yeah, I, I guess that the Blair Witch Project and Paranormal Activity are two very good examples of that. I mean, they are very, very simple movies in terms mm. of, uh, I mean, the technology they employed to produce the movies, very, very low budgets, but mm. they are extremely effective in inducing horror so they are yes and they i think what what was brilliant about those two movies is that they took their budgetary constraints and turned it into a force uh, a quality because um both movies look amateurish they look mm -hmm. like they're real you know they look the way in which movies would have looked if they were actual homemade footage and and it's a it's a it's the strategy to to decrease psychological distance. You know the 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 perception of how close something is to one. Um, so for for a long time, horror movies and even horror literature has claimed to be based on true events. You know this is a real story or 
Um, this is inspired by true events. And that makes that brings the horror closer to home. And you can do this also through uh, formal methods such as the use of uh, handheld cameras and shaky cams and surveillance footage, which is very cheap, uh, but very effective in this domain of horror movies. I'm not sure it would work if it had been a different, you know, a, a comedy that was very poorly made uh, aesthetically might not be as funny as one that was very polished, but it was a real, a real stroke of genius in those two, in those two movies. Mm -hmm. Yes, th that was why, uh, and, and of course, if we don't have enough research done on this, it's a, a unfair to press on that issue, but that's why earlier I was trying to get into how familiar things have to be to induce horror, because, for example, I don't expect any time soon to go down the mines of Moria and have to face a ball rock. <laughs> but, for example, being in my bedroom and uh, a ghost being there and grab me by the leg and take me through the hall or something like that. I mean, that's much more plausible, I guess. Of course, I don't believe in any of that, but it's much more familiar than the first example. So, yeah, yeah. No, and it's it's it's. I think it's characteristic of the whole field of horror studies that there is a lack of empirical research. Um, for a long time, this field has been left in the hands of traditional humanists from the domains of literary study and film study, and there are not any, especially in literary study, that there, there isn't a strong tradition of, of empirical quantitative uh, research methods. So a lot of the work that has been done over the last 30 or 40 years has been interpretive, and, and there is a real need of much more empirical research. Yeah. So are there uh, different kinds of horror? Is there an, a classification system for horror or not? There are several classification systems. Um, some, some are more controversial than others, but I think most scholars would agree that you can make a very basic distinction between uh, supernatural and psychological horror. So horror stories um, that involve a breach of physical laws and uh, supernatural forces of evil, for example, the exorcist about a demon that possesses a girl, a paranormal activity. Um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, a psychological horror that doesn't evolve, involve that, that breach. Um, so Silence of the Lambs, for example, about a, uh, a dangerous uh, serial killer. Um, so that is a very kind of basic typology of supernatural versus psychological. But then there are also subgenres. So the slasher film, for example, which is a specific type of usually psychological horror, but sometimes with elements of the supernatural or um, body horror, which involves violations of the human body and gruesome spectacle of uh, dismemberment. Uh, torture porn, which is focused on, well, as the name suggests, torture, uh, monster horror, um, many different subgenres. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of body horror, I don't know if you watched that movie from the late 90s, Resurrection, with the actor from Highlander. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, because, because it was basically uh, a crime horror movie where a guy was basically uh, taking different parts of the body from different people he killed to try to reconstruct the body of Jesus Christ and resurrect him. I mean, it was very disturbing, but uh, yeah, you have that kind of thing, for example. Yeah. So, um, you mentioned slasher movies. Uh, yeah. Why are they so successful? Mm, I think so. The we can trace the evolution of slasher movies um, quite far back. So a slasher movie is typically a horror movie uh, aimed at a teenage audience, featuring teenage characters who are chased by. Uh, a masked killer. 
So one of the best examples would be Halloween from 1978, uh, John Carpenter's slasher movie about a group of babysitters in a suburban environment who are hunted by Michael Myers in a mask and he wears a, he carries a knife. Uh, Scream from the mid 1990s would be another example. Again, teenage characters chased by Ghostface, a guy in a in ghostly mask. Um, and that became a very successful formula that gradually crystallized um, and really exploded in popularity with Halloween, even though we can find earlier, like Black Christmas is a, is a is an earlier example of a slasher movie. Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre from the early 1970s. Mm -hmm. It's also a movie that has slasher elements or Psycho by Alfred Hitchcock from 1960. Uh, but Halloween really um, solidified the conventions and made it evident to filmmakers in Hollywood that this was a very financially uh, attractive um, subgenre. And so um, imitators came along and produced their own slasher movies. Um, Friday the 13th, for example, mm -hmm. came out in, I think, 1980 and spawned a whole series of sequels. Yeah. And so the 1980s really was the decade of the slasher film in the United States with more than 700 slasher movies produced and released, um, aimed uh, mainly at, as I said, teenagers who I think mirrored themselves in the teenage characters who were chased by these uh, masked killers. So it's a very simple formula uh, that's very effective in doing what horror movies want to do, which is to frighten and fascinate the audience. Um, this um, scenario of being chased by a killer in a recognizably familiar suburban environment, I mean, it's, it's a scenario that's very relatable to, mm -hmm. to to many moviegoers. Uh, so it was gradually refined and and tweaked, and there were slasher movies with um, supernatural elements, for example, um, A Nightmare on Elm Street with Freddy Krueger, who chases people in their dreams, and variations on, on the slasher formula to keep it fresh. So it really um, resonated with audiences and continues to do so. I mean, new slasher movies are made still today, still uh, 40 years after um, Halloween burst onto onto the scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there have been even more recent sequels, even Halloween made by Rob Zombie, for example, mm -hmm. more recently. I, I mean, the 1980s were really prolific in terms of those kinds of movies. There were huge sagas like Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween, Hellraiser. I mean, <laughs> there, were, there were always movies like that coming out in the 1980s. So, uh, exactly. Uh, and what about uh, apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic stories? I mean, what's the appeal there? Yeah. Yeah, that does seem a little bit bizarre that so many people would be drawn to imaginative depictions of the end of the world. It doesn't it doesn't mesh very well with a conception of stories as a kind of escapism or pleasant entertainment. Um, one fact about stories that's really peculiar is that stories are usually full of trouble and evil and uh, danger and so on. And apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic stories about the end of the world and the aftermath um, sort of drive a stake into that easy conception of, of stories as, you know, fairy tales, escapism. Um, so I've been interested in, in apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic stories, partly because I really enjoy them myself. I love immersing myself into depiction of, depictions of the end of the world. And there was a real explosion in that sort of story following the Second World War, uh, probably because it became evident to everybody that humanity now had the technological means of destroying pretty much all life on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're looking at a, a, a cultural environment that's hospitable to uh, imaginings about the end of the world. So I think the appeal has to do with 
worst case cognition. I mean, people enjoy uh, cooking up these worst case scenarios. What's the worst that can happen? There is a certain there is a certain appeal, a certain dark fascination in that sort of scenario building. And I think for many of us, um, immersing ourselves in stories about the end of the world has a peculiar appeal in that um, it's a very kind of biologically primitive, ancestrally resonant scenario where it's all about killing or getting killed. And that's a big difference from my day-to-day -day life. You know, I'm sitting in my office, it's full of exam papers and uh, articles I have to look at and uh, bureaucratic tasks I have to take care of. That's not very exciting. But imaginatively transporting myself into a world that's destroyed by a nuclear war and maybe zombies are around and, you know, that's, it has a, it has a more kind of dramatic appeal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, these must be some of the oldest stories in our history. I mean, since we had the written word, let's say, apocalyptic eschatological stories have been there since the very beginning we we have it in we have them in if not all at least many of the biggest religions even so i mean it's a very right. very old genre i guess i think it is and i think it's a very predict predictable product of the human imagination so it probably even goes back to before the invention of the written word. I mean, as soon as people evolved the ability to construct and, and verbally share imaginative scenarios, as soon as we could imagine stuff and share our imaginings with others, I think uh, the horror genre and the apocalyptic genre were born. People started imagining the end of the world. They started imagining horror scenarios of being assaulted and devoured by by dangerous forces mm -hmm. so because you approach things from an evolutionary perspective i mean i when we're talking about things that have cultural manifestations i always try to ask this question to people uh, so are there many un cultural, many human universals when it comes to the horror genre? I mean, in terms of, for example, how people tend to depict monsters and stuff like that. Yeah, I think I think so. And I think for a long time, um, horror scholars have focused on the more kind of culturally variant aspects and they have approached horror stories and horror monsters as metaphors and as symptoms of social cultural anxieties mm -hmm. you take the zombie for example which is a very stereotypical horror monster um, the undead rotting contagious monster of the apocalypse uh, now, that has been seen as symptomatic of or emblematic or symbolic of of many different things. Um, so some scholars have speculated that maybe maybe the zombie was um, especially salient in the late 1960s when Night of the Living Dead came out, one of the first zombie movies, black and white movie, because the zombie very aptly symbolized uh, the Vietnam War. Um, the human yet non-human other or maybe zombies witnessed a kind of revival in the early 2000s in the wake of the war on terror and you know the zombie is a symbolic depiction of the terrorist who is like us but also not like us um, but if we look below that kind of symbolic layer the zombie has qualities that are effective in um, mobilizing a fear and disgust response, which is uh, biological and which is universal. So all humans are born with um, psychological mechanisms that allow them to respond to the danger of predation and the danger of contagion, you know, threats from predators, hostile humans, and uh, pathogenic microorganisms. And the zombie packs all of those dangers into one. It wants to eat us 
it wants to infect us with its um, zombiness. Um, so I think it's 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 really interesting to look at the at the the universal aspects of monsters, which are there to to really tap into you know universal psychological mechanisms, and so that would explain why horror stories tend to travel well. Um, a Western audience can understand and respond appropriately to a South Korean horror movie, even if we don't understand the many cultural references or the subtext or, you know, the finer sociocultural elements or the language itself. We can still understand the basic scenario of dangerous monster assaulting human characters. That travels very well. Mm -hmm. So do we have any idea if there are any socio-cultural reasons or factors that explain why in particular periods uh, different types of monsters are the most popular? So, for example, we've already talked how in the 80s there was this sort of uh, serial killer type, like, for example... Uh, Michael Myers or the guy, I can't remember his name now, but from Friday the 13th. Uh, and now more recently, for example, in Western movies and series, zombies uh, in the late 2000s, vampires, for example. Uh, I also follow Japanese uh, manga and anime and recently we've had lots of series with demons like Shenso Men, Doro, Hedoro, uh, Demon Slayer, Black Clover and others. So uh, is the, is, are there specific sociocultural factor, factors that would explain that? Or it's just a matter of, okay, so someone tries this, it works, and then other people simply copy it for a while? Right. Yeah, I think it's a combination. Um, I do think that um, certain monsters have symbolic potential that makes them particularly useful in certain cultural um, environments. Uh, but I also think it's it's really a question of a very simple kind of novelty habituation dialectic. So we have maybe a slasher movie craze, everybody flocks to the slasher movies, but once they've seen 15 slasher movies, those films kind of lose their punch and you get tired of the slasher villain and then somebody comes along and makes a good zombie movie and wow, that's new, that's interesting. And we see a whole wave of zombie movies. Um, but there is also that sociocultural resonance. Um, so for example, for the last 15 years or so, we've seen a bunch of horror movies that um, kind of tap into a sort of financial insecurity. Like you mentioned, paranormal activity, mm -hmm. um, which is which is about a dangerous demon, but also about um, the horror of having to leave your house, of being evicted, um, which has a certain salience in the wake of the financial crisis. Um, so... So I think, I mean, another example would be uh, Dracula and vampires. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the original Dracula novel was published in 1897. And it's, it, it's certainly very productive to see Count Dracula as a horror monster that embodies qualities which are well designed to elicit fear and disgust in the audience. He's a predator. He's undead. He's uh, described as disgusting and contagious and so on. So he has some very kind of universal traits. At the same time, I think Dracula, the novel, tapped into um, culturally salient anxieties over the instability of Western civilization. So in the late Victorian age, British people were beginning to be nervous about uh, uh, the permanence of the British Empire. You know, maybe the, the empire couldn't hold. Maybe Western civilization would crumble. And so here along comes a, a story about this evil 500-year-old vampire count traveling from Romania to the heart of empire. He finds himself 
uh, in the heart of empire, in London, on Piccadilly Circus, threatening uh, the integrity of Western civilization. So I think there is always that dual, dual resonance, both in terms of universal, biologically based uh, psychological mechanisms, but also more culturally variant um, social factors. So the good horror monsters tap into both um, deeply biologically conserved defense mechanisms, uh, fear and disgust and anxiety, um, but also um, culturally salient anxieties over maybe um, the vulnerability of civilization or uh, financial ruin or uh, the horrors of suburban life, you know, as a teenager in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. uh, what makes some bad mov movies so bad that they're good? <laughs> right. Yeah, that's that's something that's been puzzling me because you 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 might think if 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 people were rational, they would want to see only excellent movies. Yeah. Evidently, there is a market for less than excellent movies and even really shitty movies. Um, and so sometimes I watch movies that I expect to be really bad, uh, but I seek them out because I think there is a certain pleasure to be derived from really shitty movies. But it's usually a social pleasure. I, I, when I'm home alone, I, I don't want to watch shitty movies. I want to watch good movies. Hmm. Uh, so I've done some research on this with a good colleague uh, whose name is Mark uh, Hugh, uh, Knusen. And our argument is that movies that are really poorly made uh, don't invite you to become immersed. There is no kind of immersion. There is no uh, trans imaginative transportation into the universe of the movie. You can only kind of relate to the aesthetics of the film, the way in which it's filmed, uh, the effects, the editing, uh, the narration. And you can share how badly made it is and derive pleasure from that kind of detached, um, almost ironic engagement. So one of the worst films of all time is a movie called The Room, which is, it's it's not made to be amusing, it's it's made in all seriousness, but, but it's so poorly made that it's, it's almost otherworldly. So it's a different kind of pleasure. It's not the pleasure of immersion or identification with interesting or sympathetic characters who face fascinating and relatable dilemmas. It's, 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 it's more the pleasure of uh, picking something poorly made apart and sharing um, your, uh, sharing that picking apart with, with somebody else. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to ask you about individual differences in how people like being exposed to horror to begin with and mm -hmm. when they are exposed to it, how they respond to it. I mean, ju just to preface my question, because recently, I guess that a couple of months ago or something like that, there was a study out not applied to movies, but to music, a huge study with tens of thousands of participants from many different societies and cultures that established, they used the big five personality inventory and they established uh, correlations. Of course, it's they didn't establish causation, but correlations between certain personality traits and liking certain genres of music. So I was wondering if the same could be the case for movies and in this case, horror. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. And it's a question I often get. Uh, why is it that some people like horror movies and some people don't? And so we've done some research on it, also looking at big five um, personality traits and correlations with horror preference. Because I thought probably that was where the answer had to be. Uh, it had to be individual differences. 
And so we did find that what well, the first interesting thing we found was that uh, liking horror is not a niche phenomenon. It's not something that characterizes very few people. It's actually the majority of the population who claims to enjoy horror media. Uh, films mainly, but also literature and for some people, um, video games. So it's most people. And uh, people who enjoy horror tend to be uh, fairly uh, open to experience. They score relatively high on that one big five dimension called openness to experience. Mm -hmm. um, so they enjoy intellectual stimulation. They enjoy adventure. They enjoy thrill. Um, but, but, but those big five uh, scores don't explain that much so it's not the whole, it's not the whole picture. Um, I think there are other factors at play, including experience. Um, I think, I think if we uh, widen the perspective and talk about recreational fear rather than horror, so uh, behaviors in which people derive pleasure from feeling fear and related uh, emotions, then that's a much more kind of universally attractive phenomenon. Almost everybody enjoys recreational fear. And you see it in tiny kids who play hide and seek. So act out this primitive scenario of predation, which is also the basic scenario of the slasher movie. But you see it also among three year olds who pretend to be monsters and chase each other around. That's 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 a kind of horror experience for kids. Uh, you see it when old people watch uh, crime shows and they get the thrill, the horror of of uh, people being killed left, right and center. And so horror, horror media is just the kind of prototypical example of a much wider range of activities that we could call recreational fear activities. And so it has to do also with uh, experience, I think. Many people who say they don't like horror actually have very limited experience. They have maybe spent their entire lives staying clear of horror movies and so they don't really say they don't really know what it is they claim not to like uh, partly because there is a lot of stigma uh, associated mm -hmm. with horror uh, a lot of prejudice uh, many people think it has to do with mindless uh, gory entertainment that's you know aesthetically uninteresting maybe morally problematic maybe psychologically harmful um, so some individual variation in terms of personality traits, but also uh, prejudice, bias, and differences in experience. You know, recently I was on a train and I was sitting next to a movie, uh, no, sorry, next to a woman who was knitting. She was enjoying tea and she was knitting. And I thought to myself, why is she knitting? And then I thought, that must be one of the most pleasant meditative activities on the planet you know i want to try this i want to try this knitting maybe knitting is for everybody maybe there are qualities of knitting that are universally appealing uh but not everybody has tried knitting not everybody has mastered the art not everybody has time and so i never got, got around to it but maybe horror is like knitting you know once you once you get into it you'll find that it appeals to you i don't know it's just to say, I don't think there are there's a peculiar uh, knitting personality. There might be certain uh, big five factors that predispose you more or less to to enjoying knitting and also to enjoying horror, uh, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, what would you say about this prediction that people who score high on neuroticism would avoid horror movies? That was my own prediction when we did this study. It's a study we did a couple of years ago. Me, um, a media researcher called Jens Kjellgård Christiansen and a personality psychologist by the name of John Johnson. And I thought the strongest correlation has to be with neuroticism because neuroticism is about how strongly people react to negative stimuli. Mm -hmm. And so I thought somebody who is very neurotic, somebody who feels a lot of fear and anxiety, would stay away from horror. But that didn't seem to be the case. There wasn't a very strong correlation between uh, 
uh, neuroticism scores and and horror preferences. Um, so maybe maybe that's not the answer. Okay. So, but in your work, you talk about two different kinds of stances: the thrill-seeking stance and the fear-avoiding stance. What are yeah. these about? Yeah, this is. Um, it's a distinction of two different ways of engaging with frightening entertainment. Um, one in which you see it as a kind of challenge in keeping your own fear at a, at a tolerable level. And that's the, uh, we've called it uh, fear avoidance stance, which is, it's not a very good term because it's not avoiding fear. It's about keeping fear at the right level. And the other, um, the thrill seeking stance is, where you seek out scary entertainment, but in an attempt to maximize, you know, arousal and fear and stimulation. And this distinction, which we borrow from existing research literature, is one we used in a study conducted in a commercial haunted house. Uh, so my, my group and I have had a, we have a, a collaboration with a Danish haunted house called Dystopia Haunted House. It goes back to 2016, where we have been collecting unique and uniquely awesome data on recreational fear. Um, and so one of the earliest studies we did was one in which we asked guests at the haunted house to either minimize or maximize their own fear because we were interested in figuring out what kinds of strategies people use for emotion regulation when they're in a haunted house that's designed to frighten them. And so we recruited, I think, 280 guests, and we gave them the choice, the option of choosing either to minimize or maximize fear. And as it happens, about half of the guests chose one condition, and the other half chose the other condition. And so the guests who tr chose the minimize fear condition, we call them um, uh, white knucklers, mm -hmm. because they're, they're, we think they're the kind of person who enjoys horror but they watch horror movies like this, you know, clenching their fists uh, so hard that their knuckles turn white. Um, and that, so that's that's one type of horror fan who enjoys horror, but as a as a challenge in keeping fear at a at a tolerable level, as a challenge in making it through something that's frightening with your mental health intact. The other kind we call the adrenaline junkie. You know, it's the thrill seeker who tries to maximize arousal and stimulation that meant to to get a kick out of it. Um, so that's where that distinction comes from and these two different stances to to horror, two different ways of approaching horror, two different ways really of deriving pleasure from horror. Um, for the adrenaline junkies, it's about being mass, maximally stimulated. And for the white knucklers, it's about keeping fear at a tolerable level by using a variety of emotion regulation techniques to to manipulate your own um, emotions mm -hmm. yeah i mean there are also those people who when they're watching movies and they know something frightening is about to happen they just cover their eyes and then they watch the rest of the movie so yep. <laughs> yeah so, but does it matter if people are voluntarily exposed to horror or not? I mean, even the thrill seekers, do you think that they would enjoy horror if they were unwillingly exposed to it? I don't think so, no. Uh, because I think control, the, the perception of control is absolutely crucial to enjoying horror and other kinds of recreational fear. Um, I think you can make an interesting parallel to nightmares because horror stories share many qualities with nightmares mm -hmm. with one huge exception. And that is when you're having a nightmare, uh, you don't know that it's a simulation your no. sleeping brain is cooking up for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you have no control. You can't, you can't terminate the experience. Uh, it feels as if you are, you know, the, the, from a first person perspective, you're living through a worst case scenario that may resemble a horror movie. But when you've chosen to go to a horror movie, you can leave at any time. You can, as you say, you can cover your eyes. Um, you have that 
safety net of realizing that it's not real. It is a simulation. It's uh, the play of light and, and dark on a two-dimensional screen, or it's actors and makeup in a haunted attraction, or it's letters on a page that produce images in your mind. So I don't think for anybody, not even the most thrill-seeking adrenaline junkie, that it would be pleasant if they didn't, you know, if they were forced, if they were tied to a chair and their eyes would kept, were kept open like in uh, A Clockwork Orange and they were forced to watch a horror movie. I'm, I, I don't think that, I mean, it's, again, it's an empirical question. And if we got the ethics board to give us a green light, we could certainly <laughs> investigate it. But I don't think we're going to get that, that ethics approval. Yeah, or perhaps even if they were exposed to something they weren't expecting to be horrifying. Because, I mean, if you go to a horror movie, you're expecting that. But if, for example, you, you were tricked and thought that it was a comedy movie and suddenly it turns into a horror movie, perhaps you don't like it as much. So. Exactly. I think you would feel cheated because you feel there is a kind of contract when you buy a ticket to a movie that's advertised as a comedy, you expect to laugh. When you buy a ticket to a movie that's advertised as a horror movie, you expect to scream. Uh, you'd probably be angry if if there was, that would be kind of cool though, if <laughs> somebody inserted a really frightening scene in a comedy movie and then, but I think the audience would be angry. Uh, so it's not a very good, you know, a commercial strategy. Uh, but, but you can find many so-called prank videos on YouTube where uh, people have hidden cameras and then mm -hmm. some unwitting innocent bystander is exposed to a horror scenario. For example, in an elevator, maybe the lights go out and a girl in ghost makeup crawls out and, and, and jumps out and, and they're terrified. They don't derive any pleasure from it. Mm. It's a really nasty situation for them. It's funny for, for us to, to look at it, but um, that would be maybe an analog or a real world example of people being exposed to a horror scenario that they haven't chosen and aren't expecting and that, that they don't know is make-believe and so it's not it's not pleasant to them. Yeah, I mean that's a very interesting example even though those are not of course uh, controlled experiments and uh, it's just anecdotal evidence but I've never seen one single person reacting positively to, to that kind of exposure. So. No. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but uh, let's talk about uh, characters now, because there are different kinds of characters and uh, I'm not focusing here necessarily on the horror genre, but on stories in general. Um, does the kinds of character that people like have anything to do with their personality? Mm. I think so. Um, and I was part of a very cool a research project that was spearheaded by my colleague Jens Kjellgård Christiansen about who likes villains um, because we were interested in finding out if if it's a specific type of people who is fascinated with uh, villain characters um, because there are I remember when when my kids were small they enjoyed dressing up as villain characters you know Darth Vader for example um, and uh, I have acquaintances who have, you know, posters of Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th or Michael Myers from uh, from Halloween. And so we thought that's that's kind of strange because a movie like Halloween does not encourage the audience to to sympathize or empathize with the villain. You know, mm -hmm. they encourage the audience to empathize with the characters who are haunted by the villain. But, but there are many people who are fascinated with villains from popular culture. And usually we can see, you know, the, all the, the merchandise associated with high profile um, pop culture is often focused on, on evil characters. So that was, a, it, it's a bit of a mystery. And so we did this study in which we looked at uh, personality traits and villain fascination and found that, that the people who who like villains do tend to have sort of villainous traits themselves uh, in terms of the dark triad. They tend to score fairly highly. Um, so they kind of, they resonate with the villain. That doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean if you're a parent and your 
a teenage kid has a poster of Darth, Darth Vader on the vault on the wall that you should be really worried. Uh, but there does seem to be some personality traits that correlate with preference or liking fascination with certain kinds of characters. Mm -hmm. Just for the audience, the dark triad traits are Machiavellianism, narcissism and psychopathy, right? Right. Thank you. Yeah. So I would like to ask you about a paper you published fairly recently, uh, which is titled Pandemic Practice, Horror Fans and Morbidly Curious Individuals Are More Psychologically Resilient During the COVID-19 Pandemic. So what was that about? Yeah, that was a really fun paper to do. And it's a paper that traveled around the world. It got an amazing amount of attention from the press and and really um, resonated with people, I think, because I think because the finding is kind of surprising and kind of not, you know, it's the kind of, you know, the Ig Nobel prizes <laughs> that are given to research that makes you laugh and then think, uh, and this might be one such uh, kind of type of, of research, because we found that people who watch many horror movies had better psychological resilience during the COVID lockdowns which is kind of, uh, I, I guess it's a, a kind of what the fuck moment. Uh, but then it sort of makes sense. But to, and I'll explain what we did and why we did it and what we found, but it has a kind of interesting uh, history. Uh, because early on in the pandemic, um, a science journalist who had done an article uh, several years ago about some of my work uh, got in touch on Twitter I think she was sort of teasing me. She was, you know, saying, you know, you you told me years ago that horror may serve certain adaptive functions in terms of letting people live imaginatively through worst case scenarios. Maybe it's a way in which we prepare for, you know, um, disaster and, and worst case scenarios. Uh, so do you think then maybe that people who watch many horror movies are doing a better job of um, staying sane during the COVID lockdowns. And I thought that's actually a really interesting question. So we assembled a team consisting of myself, um, John Johnson, who worked with us on both the dark personality villain liking paper and also the the big five horror liking paper, uh, Jens Kjellgård Christiansen and uh, Colton Scrivener, um, a researcher from Chicago whose specialty is morbid curiosity. A uh, personality trait that is correlated with how interested in people are in learning about macabre, dark, disturbing aspects of the world. And so we did this study in which we looked at whether whether there was any correlation between uh, how many horror movies people watch and their mental health during the lockdown. Because as we know, many people, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, had a really hard time. Uh, because it was, to most of us, it was historically unprecedented. We we hadn't experienced anything like this ever before. And the future was uncertain. You know, two years ago, we didn't really know what to expect. We didn't know exactly how dangerous this virus was. Um, and there was a lot of anxiety, a lot of unpredictability, which people don't like. And for many people, the only frame of reference we had was popular culture. We hadn't ourselves experienced anything like the pandemic, but some of us had seen many movies um, that sort of looked like what we were living through. Zombie movies, alien invasion movies, uh, disaster movies. So that became a kind of frame of reference. And so we found two really interesting things. One thing was that, yes, people who watched many horror movies uh, had fewer symptoms of psychological distress. They didn't have as many problems getting to sleep, they didn't have as many problems, you know, focusing, which makes sense if, if horror allows you to practice coping strategies. And I think that's one of the main adaptive benefits of, of horror entertainment generally is that it provides um, a kind of safe context for us to practice the art of regulating our own emotions. Uh, that's a really important skill, uh, being able to keep anxiety down, being able to to manage fear. But we also found that people people who watch many 
uh, movies of the type we call prepper movies, so apocalyptic movies and invasion movies and disaster movies, they felt better prepared for this uncertain future because they had imaginatively simulated tens or hundreds or thousands of worst case scenarios. Um, so they felt they were better able to predict what might happen. And so they didn't suffer as much from the, you know, the fear of the unknown. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I guess that perhaps another thing that would be or would have been interesting to explore is if these uh, morbidly curious type individuals would also be more willing to uh, go through risks during the pandemic or expose mm. themselves more just because they don't uh, are as frightened as other people to being exposed to gross things, yep. for example. Yeah, that's that's actually also what we found. That they were because morbidly curious people are interested in learning about um, things like what a virus does to the body, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was also an interesting correlation there. And of course, this is a, a correlational study. We can't, on the basis of that study, say anything about causation. We can't claim that mm -hmm. because people watch many horror movies, then they become better able to to um, to stay sane during a, a, a pandemic. Uh, but I think we can speculate, and I think you can make a, um, a reasonable argument that, that such a, a causal relationship does exist. Mm -hmm. So, just one last question, a general one. What do you think that evolutionary theory brings to the table uh, in comparison to more traditional approaches in uh, literary studies, literary theory, and even approaches to other types of art? Mm -hmm. Well, from my perspective, it, it really brings a lot. Um, and at the same time, as you know, uh, it's a it's a controversial approach, maybe especially to the study of literature, which in the academic world is dominated by uh, more kind of political, culturally oriented approaches. Post uh, postmodernist approaches, perhaps. Postmodernist approaches, post structuralist ones. Um, that's that's right, um, but. I think evolutionary theory has so much explanatory power, like we talked about uh, in, the, in the beginning of the conversation. Yeah. And I've been very inspired by people like uh, Joseph Carroll, who has also been on your show, yeah. uh, who, who, who is a real pioneer. Uh, he's been working on constructing an evolutionary theory and interpretive practice in the domain of literary study for, uh, I guess, almost 30 years now. And he's been extremely helpful to me and other early career scholars interested in in seeing how evolutionary psychology and evolutionary social science more generally can be adapted to 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 say something interesting about literature. So for me, it's about explanation. I think I'm I've always been personally fascinated with stories. I always loved reading and watching movies and so on. But I also wanted to understand why. What is the deep appeal of stories? Why are humans, why do we spend so much time in made up worlds? Uh, whenever we have a spare moment, we, we daydream, we you know, fly on the wings of imagination to faraway places and worst case scenarios or best case scenarios. Um, we watch television shows and we listen to made up stories and it's, 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 it's real characteristic of our species. And I think we need an evolutionary perspective to exp to to understand why. Um, so that's one um, item of value for an evolutionary approach. Mm -hmm. So just before we go, where can people find you and your work on the internet? Mm. Um, so I share I try to share most of my work on Twitter. Um, so I have a profile uh, that's Matthias Clayson. Um, but also, I'm, as you mentioned uh, in the beginning, director of something called the Recreational Fear Lab, uh, which also has a Twitter account um, and a website uh, at the address uh, fear.au.dk. So those would be a couple of places to, 
to follow the research. Okay, so Dr. Klassen, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It was really fun to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Okay. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, hit the subscription button, all of those things you already know. And please consider supporting the show either on PayPal or Patreon. All of the links will be in the description box of the interview starting at $1 per month. So it would be a great help. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Ginty, Zurtger Vosbo, Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, George Spinha, Phil Kavanagh, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Dugny, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Kassan, Ivan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dremiti Grigoriev, Diego Lanonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punta, Radana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortes, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy and Trader in NYC. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vangnagdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardos France, Thomas Trumbull and Nuno Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.